Hello, my name is Douglas Kilmer, and I'm president of the United States National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. We were the first ICOMOS National Committee. There are now 107 of them. The members of that first US National Committee played a leading role in drafting the version of the World Heritage Convention that was ratified as an international treaty in 1972. Now, our overarching goal is the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, which protects, preserves, and presents heritage from around the world. Today, we are living in a time when heritage is under physical attack in Ukraine and is under heavy threat in countries bordering Russia. Like Ukraine, Moldova is not a member of NATO, for the most part because of enormous and devastating economic pressure from Russia. I've had the honor of working in Moldova with our speaker today, Professor Sergei Mesteta. Professor Mesteta is one of the leading scholars and intellectuals in Moldova. He is the recipient of the most prestigious academic award presented by the government of Moldova, the, the National Award for Science. He's been a visiting scholar at Dumbarton Oaks many times. Just across the river from Moldova is the breakaway state of Transnistria, a state acknowledged as a state only by Russia. Transnistria exists only by means of heavenly support by Russia. And it is the location of what is likely the largest depot of weapons in Eastern Europe. Just north of Transnistria is Ukraine. Professor Vestada will give us the historical context in which this geopolitical flashpoint emerged. This context is fascinating, instructive, and frightening. With that, I introduce Professor Vestada. Thank you. So dear colleagues, dear Doug, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this series of webinars organized by ICOMAS US, which is a great pleasure from one point and from another point, it's a great occasion to discuss about the situation in our region. Unfortunately, as Doug already mentioned, we are under pressure of the Russian invasion and Russian war against Ukraine, our neighbors, our friends and our relatives. Uh, so today, um, the topic of my presentation is about Transnistria, but of course not just Transnistria, but uh, the situation means about Moldova, because officially Transnistria is part of the Republic of Moldova, even if this part of Moldova declared independence in 1990 and uh, trying to survive somehow or trying to insist uh, to be independent, but this unrecognized uh, part of land, uh, it's, it is between geographically between uh, Ukraine and on Moldova and exist, as already it was mentioned, of support, direct support and involvement of Russia. So Republic of Moldova uh, is known as independent country since 1991 as a result of collapse of Soviet Union and this parade of declarations uh, of independence of the former Soviet republics. So on August 27, 1991, uh, Republic of Moldova, the Parliament of Republic of Moldova declared independence. And since uh, the, uh, the 1991, uh, the new, the young and very sensible uh, region became independent and trying to develop statehood and to become a real independent country. So it's not so easy because the region always was uh, in the, the um, uh, their risk area and Russia during the last centuries has a huge interest in this Black Sea region and including in Moldova. So Transnistria is part of Republic of Moldova, but historically has a long uh, specific background. Uh, and then I will try today to, to point few uh, historical facts which uh, 
explain better the developments in the region and explain better what it is and how it is Transnistria today. So Republic of Moldova is known as independent country and since 91 uh, established a lot of diplomatic relations with many countries around the world. Uh, for example, the United States uh, uh, opened uh, the embassy among uh, other countries. Actually, the first official embassy uh, in Moldova is United States and trying to support Moldova during the last three decades uh, to develop democracy and to develop, uh, let's say, sustainable uh, economy and also sustainable democracy, which is not so easy because the transition period from the totalitarian country to the democratic one, it's very difficult process and always it's links to the, uh, to the past and always it's links to the mentality, which is not so easy to change because in many cases people are looking back. That's why we are trying to, to, to move uh, on and to, to develop a real open mind uh, society and, uh, of course, to, to maintain our independence and sovereignty. So, um, since end of Soviet Union, since this perestroika uh, launched by the Gorbachev uh, Republic of Moldova among Baltic states, uh, Baltic Republic at that time, and also Caucasus, uh, tried to, to um, explain that we need to become sovereign and we would like to use our own language and also to, to have a democratic changes in our society. And if you remember in 1990, it was the new intention of the Moscow to establish the uh, Soviet uh, treaty and to um, invite the republics and the leaders of the Rep Soviet republics to sign this new treaty of the Soviet Union. And Moldova among Baltic states uh, rejected this initiative, even if it was organized a referendum. So the most of population didn't support and especially the political elites at that time didn't support the Moscow initiative. And in this situation, uh, the, the Gorbachev and other leaders around him said, if you will not sign the agreement, we will open the two new republics on the territory of Moldova. And that's happened in August 1990 in south part of Republic of Moldova uh, was declared so-called the new Gagauzian Soviet Socialist Republic. Gagauzian Republic uh, actually doesn't exist. And the, the Gagauzian community, it's a small minority in south part of Republic. And you could see on the map of the yellow, it's marked the, the communities the, uh, living uh, by Gagauzian, uh, which is uh, a Turkish population established here in the 19th century as a result of colonization by the Tsarist empire. Bring them so or move them from the actual Bulgarian territory uh, and settle them in the south part of, of, of this Arabia. So uh, at the moment, we don't know exactly how many uh, Gagauzians are living, but according to the 10 years ago census, uh, there are around 150,000 people. But uh, maybe you know, uh, half of the inhabitants of Moldova left the country during the last two and a half decades and they are living outside of the country. So uh, especially, uh, so not just Moldovans or other ethnicities, but including uh, Gagauzians, they also left the country. And we don't know exactly if uh, they are 160,000 or maybe less, maybe uh, half of them. Um, so they are not in compact region, just Comrade, so-called capital and, and some few villages and cities around. It's more compact than that, but other uh, villages are uh, placed in the south. Even in these circumstances in 1990, it was quite difficult situation. Uh, so um, uh, after long discussions and laugh, after long political fights, in 1994, it was established a special law uh, for this region and they received the status of autonomy. So now uh, it's called Autonomous Republic Gagauzia of own, let's say administrative staff, but it's part of the uh, general structure of Moldova using our educational system. So nothing specific in the region, excepting of course, the right to uh, uh, study in all language, Gagauzian, and also they officially call in the law that they have additional uh, Russian language. So Gagauzian, Romanian language and uh, Russian language are three main official language for, for the area. But mostly they are speaking in Russian and uh, they are, even if they are Turks, uh, they are orthodox and most uh, the, the, the most useful language in the region is Russian and the education system also it's a Russian language. Uh, so the Gagauzian as a native language is learned by um, students since uh, primary school and in the high school, but this is just like an old language. 
uh, native language, but not the whole system uh, in Gagauzian language, which is, is very interesting. And the second conflict region was established also in 1990 with support and direct involvement of the Moscow and the KGB. Uh, in September 1990, uh, the left bank of Nest River proclaimed the independence. So this uh, uh, Pridnestrovian Soviet Socialist Republic became the 17th Republic as part of the Soviet Union, unrecognized, of course, but it was open just as a conflict in opposition to the Kishinev leaders who didn't support the new treaty of the Soviet Union. But since this time, Transnistria became a huge problem, not just for Moldova, but for the Eastern Europe. Um, population also is not so huge uh, uh, living in this area, just a little bit more than half million uh, at the end of Soviet Union. But now, according to the official data from Transnistrian separatist administration, there are uh, more than 400,000 people. But also the phenomenon of migration uh, is very high developed in Transnistria too. And unofficially, some experts in demography are saying that in Transnistria nowadays are living around 200,000 people. But it's just unofficial data. So from the whole amount of inhabitants in Transnistria, one third of population are Moldovans or Romanians, is depending on it, because the ethnicity, it's another sensitive issue in Moldova. And you could see on the second place are Russians and then Ukrainians and Bulgarians. But even if it's such structure, the structure, ethnic structure in the region, uh, they are using officially, they have three languages so Russian, um, Moldovan, and uh, Ukrainian. But most of the documents and the language officially using uh, between the administration, but even in the street, you, you could uh, see just the Russian language, which is dominating. They have some uh, schools with the Moldovan teaching and just very few Ukrainians, so, but mostly like in Gagauzia, population and administration is uh, Russified. And this process happened during the Soviet time. And this is a result of the Soviet regime and mentality. So um, if just briefly to look back to the, our history, of of course, Moldova has a rich history and uh, rich heritage because Moldova since medieval time was independent, a principality, and just in, uh, at the beginning of 19th century, part of principality of Moldova was occupied by the uh, Russian Empire. The Russian Empire um, enlarged the, the territories to the west. Uh, at the end of uh, 18th century, they reached the Dnestr as the western border of the Russian Empire. But later on, just in context of the Russian-Ottoman uh, wars, they uh, intend to occupy more uh, regions and more countries, including uh, Moldova, Wallachia, and uh, of course, the uh, territory south of Danube, which is nowadays Bulgaria. Uh, and after this long uh, period of wars, uh, Russia uh, succeeded to, to occupy just part of some territories. And one of these was Bessarabia, the territory between Prut and Nest rivers. So the new region occupied and in bold in the Russian uh, empire was uh, called Bessarabia. And Bessarabia as a name of the territory, it's, uh, uh, it's old one, but refers to the south part of, of Moldova. But the Russian empire tried to enlarge this name to the whole territory occupied in, in, in 1812. And they uh, named this oblast uh, Bessarabia and later on Gubernia. Uh, and actually the next 100 years, uh, this territory was known as Bessarabska Gubernia as part of the Russian empire. Um, from another part of, of the, the, the history uh, in Europe, um, during this 19th century, the Principality of Moldova and uh, Wallachia appropriate much because the language is the same, the history very close, uh, a lot of many things together, the heritage. Uh, and uh, finally, at the middle of 19th century, Moldova and Wallachia uh, unified and slowly moved to develop the independent country, which was called Romania. So Romania as a new neighbor uh, country of the Russian Empire in the uh, Western part. So um, the competition between Romania and Russia still remain, but not so uh, risky because the uh, relation in this uh, period of time, the, uh, participating in different diplomatic affairs. Uh, anyway, uh, as you know, as a result of the First World War, uh, uh, so the, and the collapse of the empires, uh, the new uh, 
political map uh, was rebuilt and Bessarabia became a part of Romania during the interwar period. But just to uh, uh, resume uh, the impact of um, domination and including the Bessarabia on, uh, on the Russian empire, uh, it's uh, so actually they canceled the autonomy and they transform, uh, transferred the whole uh, Russian system, administration, political, religious, and so on and so on, and including the language. So they canceled the Romanian language service in churches slowly because, and also in the school, and during the whole uh, 19th century until the beginning of, uh, of 20, the Russian language dominated the administrative, religious, and educational uh, systems on territory of Bessarabia, and it's called the process of uh, denationalization or Russification of Bessarabia. Here in this table, I just collected a few data to demonstrate the effects of the, the uh, ethnic transformations on territory of Bessarabia. So you could see during the, the 19th century how slowly the majority of inhabitants uh, transform uh, and or how other mi uh, um, minorities increase um, the number uh, against the majority. So you could see the Moldovans at the beginning of 19th century uh, were 86% uh, of inhabitants and Ukrainians, Russians or the Slavics just 6.5 and during let's say eight decades they moved to the 20 percentage. The same situation with the Jewish from 1.5 until actually uh, about 12 percentage. So not just Jewish, but also, as I mentioned, Bulgarians, Gagauzians, and other minorities which have been moved by the Russian administration, especially to the cities and in south part of Bessarabia, because it's the plain land and they try to colonize and to develop agriculture in this area. So you could see the number of inhabitants increased from half million about to two millions, but um, um, as a result of this colonization, uh, they support uh, move to the region minorities, not just uh, uh, other uh, or Romanians or Moldova. So a good book, which was published just uh, two years ago by, by one of my colleagues, explained the moral process uh, of this Bessarabia or competing Russia and Romanians uh, on territory of Bessarabia as a contested uh, borderland. So I recommend you if you are interested in the history of 19th century and early 20th century, this book of my colleague Andrei Kushko, which described in details the whole processes and phenomenon of the 19th century Bessarabia. So as I mentioned during the interwar period, Bessarabia as a result of uh, um, uh, this democratic process and the, the voting uh, of the parliament Sfatu uh, in March 1918, uh, they decided to unify Bessarabia of Romania. Uh, the decision, which was very uh, debated by, uh, um, until today is debated, of course, but Bolshevik Russia didn't accept uh, this decision and during, and they didn't recognize the unification of Bessarabia uh, of Romania together with Japan. They rejected or they didn't support the idea and the, the debates in the Paris conference in 1921, even if the most important countries, European countries supported and agree and accept the unification and the new borders of Romania, uh, Bolshevik Russia and Japan, uh, at that time, uh, Italy too, but later on Italy uh, supported the, the uh, agreement uh, and the peace uh, was recognized, accepting just, just Russia. So Russia um, or the Soviet Union already since 1922 uh, contested uh, the Bessarabia and uh, in 1924, um, they organized uh, on the uh, eastern border of Romania as part of U Soviet Ukraine, so-called uh, Autonomous Republic, uh, Mol Moldavian Autonomous Republic. Later on, it was known as Transnistria. So, but at that time in 1924, this uh, territory you see it's marked in, in orange uh, color, uh, became part of uh, um, Ukraine, Soviet Republic, uh, not just to, to, to enforce the Ukraine, but to, to prepare like a, a, a bridge uh, to attack uh, Romania and from this area to organize different uh, provocations uh, on territory of Bessarabia during the interwar period, and also to demonstrate that the uh, um, Moldavian Soviet Republic or autonomous Soviet Republic has uh, the right and uh, extension to the West 
and to, to, to try to bring this Arabia as how they call back to the, the Soviet Union, even if uh, this Arabia was not, was not part of Soviet Union from the beginning, because they declared uh, the Democratic Republic at the end of 1917 and uh, rejected the, the uh, Russian Empire. So during this period of time was very difficult uh, and uh, many provocations from the Soviet Union happened from this bank, uh, from Transnistrian uh, side. Uh, and in 1940, as you know, as a result uh, of agreement between uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, in 1939, they signed so-called uh, Ribbentrop uh, Molotov Pact, uh, this international treatment, which they agree how to divide the power and the countries and the influence in Europe. And Bessarabia was part of this agreement, including Baltic states, Poland, and, and other um, uh, decisions between uh, Nazi and uh, uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. So in June, uh, officially, so uh, they occupied Bessarabia, and uh, this issue also is very debated in Moldovan society because during the Soviet time, uh, this step was called liberation, but in Romanian historiography, it's occupation. So you could see one even how uh, divide society and uh, how it is debatable. So very soon after occupation in August uh, 1940, they organized the new 15 Soviet Republic, so Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic, including territory of Transnistria. So you could see on the left bank of Nestor, along the, the, the Nestor, this territory, just part of the former autonomous Moldavian Republic, uh, but not the whole Bessarabia. They cut the south, the access to the Black Sea and to the Danube, and also the north part, which is, uh, was in the north part of Bukovina. And they include uh, these two uh, regions to the Ukraine Soviet Republic. So that's why these two uh, regions also are very sensitive and including nowadays when the conflict uh, in Ukraine and the war against Ukraine, some uh, voices are trying to, to, to say, you see, these regions uh, also are not part of Ukraine and Romania has to reject them, which is very provocative and it's very uh, difficult to, to to, to discuss. So during the Soviet time, um, the, the, the Mold Soviet Moldavia suffered very much. So I'll not go deeply in such details, but briefly I, I'll mention some, some uh, political and military activities on territory of uh, Soviet Moldavia done by the, the uh, official Soviet Union authorities, by the KGB, uh, by the uh, militia and by, by the administrative staff. So in first of all, in 1940, 1941, they begin the, uh, well, actually they extend the terror, which already was used on territory of Ukraine and other Soviet republics during the 1930s. So in 1940, 1941, they uh, started to arrest uh, various people, uh, which they consider traitors or enemy of the Soviet power, and especially Romanian officers or people who just have been involved in, in the Romanian army. Uh, some of them directly were, were killed by the um, uh, Soviet officers. Former mayors or policemen or judges working for the Romanian administration, members of political parties, and also member of the uh, Svatul Tseri. I mentioned this was the most important parliamentary um, uh, body in 1917-1918, uh, which voted unification of Romania, and they consider the members of the Svato Tseri as a traitors, and most of them who remain to live uh, on territory of Soviet Moldavia, they have been arrested and most of them deported to the Siberia or Kazakhstan. So uh, actually in this, uh, about one year, uh, more than 1,000 people have been arrested uh, and condemned as collaboration with the Romanian authorities. And uh, as uh, I already mentioned, some of them executed uh, immediately without any, uh, any process. So um, also during this period of time, just during the one year, they, uh, the, the uh, Soviet authorities started to mobilize people to, for different working camps uh, around Soviet Union. So you could see some quotas established uh, monthly. So in each month, the workers from Moscow came to Kishinev to collect around 10,000, 20,000 or over, over 40,000 of people and move them to different uh, labor camps uh, in the Soviet uh, Union and to involve them in different uh, constructions or military staff activities. So 
Um, also, uh, another uh, step to, to against Moldovans uh, uh, happened in, in um, uh, just before uh, the, the, uh, the, the Second World War uh, involved, had been involved Moldova or Romania together with the Nazi Germany uh, attack Soviet Union. Uh, about 20,000 people have been arrested and deported to the Soviet Union. So uh, uh, this is also a very um, uh, specific situation, and most of them have been declared anti-Sovietic elements. But we know that most of uh, uh, people ha which have been deported just because they um, were, did not support uh, or did not accept the new Soviet rules, and they didn't protest officially or didn't protest actively, but that the Soviet authorities considered that they are uh, dangerous ele elements, enemy for the Soviet development, and just deported them to different areas of Siberia and Kazakhstan. So you could see just during the one year, about five percentage of population have been deported, executed, mobilized uh, in different parts of the Soviet Union. So, um, uh, which is, I think, a, a huge amount uh, of population. And then um, uh, during the Second World War, of course, uh, Bessarabia suffered too much because uh, some of Moldovans have been enrolled in the Soviet army. And after 1941, some of Moldovans or Bessarabians, Romanians, have been enrolled in the Romanian army. And we have many cases when uh, one brother have fight against another brother because they have been involved, enrolled in two different armies. So, uh, I'll not discuss uh, more details about Second World War, which is enough, enough, uh, another important part of our history, and also it's very sensitive until today. But after Second World War, after Soviet uh, authorities came back, they actually uh, started to, to um, recover or uh, to, to, to develop the, the Soviet administration infrastructure and also the politics in the region, even if the Second World War uh, damaged a lot of econ uh, economic part of, of society. So they established some plans which have to be reached until end of the year. And uh, because uh, Moldova is agriculture country, of course, they uh, have uh, tried to involve this policy to collect the, the uh, agriculture stuff for the Soviet Union. And you could see some plans, which is uh, very, uh, I think, uh, huge uh, for, for, for Moldova. And in 1945, uh, 1946 uh, was not so good from the climb, uh, not so good years for, from the climb perspectives. Uh, and the, 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 uh, even in these circumstances, uh, Soviet authorities decided to collect as much as possible uh, agriculture uh, stuff uh, from, from Moldova. And this provoked, of course, famine, which is, I, I think, um, not like Golodomor in Ukraine, but something like this. Uh, discussing about the proportion, uh, of course, it's a little bit different, uh, but comparatively uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but Moldovan, uh, so the number of inhabitants in Moldova is just two and a half million. And you can imagine uh, that it was also a, a huge um, problem for, for Moldovan society. And uh, we have a lot of victims. You could see here just few data. Uh, so uh, uh, many death uh, people uh, because of dystrophy, and you could see some statistics. Just in December 45, over 50,000 of people have been uh, died uh, as a result of dystrophy. And also the number increased during the 1946 and 1947. Um, even if the official data didn't uh, uh, show this impact, Nowadays, as a result of opening the archive after collapse of Soviet Union, we could discuss uh, more about the impact of this situation of the post-war Soviet Moldavia. So another 5% of inhabitants have been actually destroyed uh, by the Soviet uh, administration as a result of uh, famine. And it, that is not all. Just two years later, in 1949, uh, a new wave of deportation started. And actually, they uh, decided to uh, bring and uh, send to Siberia and Kazakhstan the richest family, so-called Kyabur or Kulak. 
and uh, over 11,000 families. So we don't know exactly the number, but um, uh, as a result of the, the opening the archives and, and checking the documents and files, so uh, historians who are working on this issue established that over 35,000 people have been deported from Moldova just in one night in 19, uh, 1949. So, and that also is not all, because uh, in 1951, just two years later, the new deportation started, but this, at this time, Soviet authorities focused on the religious communities, especially um, um, from um, uh, Evangelic Church, and they deported over 700,000 families uh, from from uh, Moldova to Kazakhstan and Siberia, and what I'm saying uh, saying about Moldova, that includes Transnistria too. So uh, it's a it's a sensitive issue, and always when we're trying to discuss about these uh, aspects of our past, uh, we uh, try to, to stress attention that we don't want to ethnicize the history and the past. Check the data, and you will see that the Soviet authorities bring and collect and deport and then kill. Uh, all people, uh, uh, they didn't mind if you are Russian, Ukrainian, Moldovan, or uh, Jewish, or, or something else. Uh, if, you, uh, if they consider that you are enemy for the Soviet authorities, they will uh, do what they want. So, um, as you know, uh, uh, the result of Perestroika and the new initiative of Gorbachev at the end of the 80s uh, to restructure and to, to reorganize, to, to reform the Soviet Union, in many re Soviet republics started the national movements, to, uh, national movements to, to stress the attention of the Moscow that uh, we need to talk in our own language, not just in Russian, and we would like to support local native people in the administrative position because during the Soviet time, most of the, the leaders, most of the chefs, most of the chairs have been um, named, appointed by the uh, Communist Party from different other regions, from the Russian uh, uh, Federation, uh, and local native pe people uh, were not uh, on the main top of the, the administration of the uh, uh, local or the national or the Republican uh, level. So uh, at the beginning of this movement, Gorbachev was like an idol. And you could see even uh, if the, the nation movement was based on, let's say, Moldovan language or so Romanian language uh, or other historic facts about the occupation of this Arabia, about uh, uh, um, the, the many voices uh, started to, to say that we would like to reunite of uh, uh, Romania. Even in these circumstances, the specific historic background, Gorbachev was seen as a leader of society, uh, which gave the opportunity to, to, to meet, to discuss, and to have the new aspirations for the future. So in these circumstances, of course, the new wave of confrontation between um, Romanian speakers and Russian speakers uh, started. Uh, some of them didn't accept the idea that uh, our language is Romanian, because during the Soviet Union, they tried to build a new nation and the new language, Moldovan, different than Romanian language is, but uh, officially, not just scientifically, but we know that there's no differences. And still today, so we have in school uh, the curriculum uh, and the official language is it's called Romanian, uh, not Moldovan. Even the part of society doesn't like this. So you could see uh, some, some supporters of the communist party, of the left parties, that Moldova, the language is Moldovan. Uh, so it's, it's a sensitive issue. And um, we, uh, so after de uh, declares, uh, declaring the independence, so of course it was not so easy to establish the, the administrative body, political body, and to start to develop the new independent and sovereign country, uh, because in 1992, a real war started between this separatist region and uh, official administration of Moldova. In March, 1992, uh, actually three decades ago, um, the, the separatist military staff attacked the Moldovan police, and they started to fight against Moldovan official authorities with support of some Cossacks from Ukraine and, and Russia. And of course, with direct support uh, of um, 14 or 
so-called 14 army of the uh, former 14 army of the Soviet Union, at that time already the army of the Russian uh, Federation, settled on Transnistria. And uh, because it was one of the biggest army in the Soviet Union of many uh, weapons and military staff settled in Transnistria, of course, was easy to equip uh, the separatist uh, uh, military uh, uh, staff and military uh, and after that, they became a, a real army. So they started to fight the real uh, weapons against Moldova and uh, uh, was uh, not so long military conflict, but uh, what is happening now in Ukraine, it's exactly uh, the same scenario as uh, it was applied uh, in 92 against uh, Moldova. So you could see the bombing, you could see using the tanks and a lot of victims, a lot of refugees, from the left bank to the right one, um, a lot of uh, damages in different cities and villages um, on both sides, but especially on Transnistrian because the most of uh, the military stuff happened along the river. Um, so um, nowadays, after three decades, the conflict between Kishinev and Tiraspol, the two big cities, uh, so-called capitals, uh, it's called small but vicious conflict because um, uh, just during the few months between March and June, um, so over 800 people uh, died and more than 5,000 wounded and over 1, 100,000 people, uh, so refugees uh, from Transnistria to Moldova or to other parts uh, of the world. Economically speaking, this conflict was uh, very expensive for Moldova, actually one annual budget. And um, it was, uh, I think, a huge gap uh, for the future economic developments of Moldova and including on uh, this part of Transnistria too. Um, speaking about the, the effects and impact, in June it was signed the agreement uh, by insistence of Elchin and it was an agreement in Moscow signed uh, together uh, with the leader, separatist leader uh, of Transnistria, Smirnov, and our president Snegor uh, in Moscow, they agreed to stop the fight, to stop the fire and uh, uh, to try to uh, sit and to discuss uh, through dialogue uh, to find solutions for the future development, which was very promising because in, first of all, they stopped to the fight, uh, but the, they established the border uh, along the Nestor River and uh, also the, the Moscow insisted that the city of Bender and five another uh, around villages or cities around Bender uh, to be under control of separatist authorities too on the right bank of the Nestor River. So actually on the territory, or proper uh, territory of Republic of Moldova. So, um, uh, which is a very debated issue until today. So after three decades uh, of so-called negotiation or just uh, trying to, to, to discuss and to find the, the solutions, actually we didn't succeed so much because until today, it's a real border between separatist region and uh, official Moldovan territory. So during the last three decades, Transnistria built own system, administrative, military, they have own army. Um, so we don't know exactly how many soldiers, but uh, some of some, uh, some data are saying that they have uh, over 7,000 soldiers equipped quite well equipped uh, by, by, the, by the Russian equipment military staff. And also uh, they have uh, um, a local currency, which is called Transnistrian Ruble. Uh, uh, they have the educational system and so on and so on. And also as a result of this agreement between Russia and Moldova, they agree to have peacekeepers uh, on territory of Transnistria or between these two conflict region, uh, over 500 uh, uh, soldiers as a peacekeepers are trying to check and to control the region and to be between Moldova and Transnistria. But another 2000 of the Russian soldiers still uh, sitting on territory of Transnistria and they are not peacekeepers, just as part of military uh, staff of Russia on territory of Transnistria. So um, uh, this region is quite difficult because also uh, we have some deposit of the military staff from the Soviet Union and a couple of discussions happened during the last decades between Russia and Moldova to bring back or to bring to, uh, to Russia this uh, staff because it's very dangerous and if something wrong is happening, uh, actually it could explode and destroy uh, 
uh, an area of uh, about 40 uh, square, square kilometers. So it is very difficult. Um, I would like just to give an example about the, the discourse. I checked the, the local textbooks from Transnistria, so-called the native uh, history or the local uh, history, and uh, concerning the, the, this uh, period of time, the conflict uh, uh, from 1992, you could see uh, a page from the textbooks from the eighth and ninth grade, which is showing the, the uh, pictures and describing uh, the, the uh, military events. And uh, of course, uh, Moldova is enemy, Romania is enemy. And you could see uh, on this picture, one of these pictures, uh, which is mentioning death to Romanian cannibals. So it's part of the, uh, of the educational textbooks, so educational uh, material uh, in uh, nowadays uh, schools from Transnistria, which is totally against any recommendations of the Council of Europe or the UN uh, to try to, to avoid the hate discourse or speech and to try to, to uh, through the education, to build the peace. And uh, you could see uh, the history textbooks actually are doing totally different. Um, and uh, the new generation uh, of young uh, people uh, in Transnistria are educated in this style against Moldova, against Romania, like it was uh, during the Soviet time that Romania is enemy for the Soviet Union. So um, the next uh, example, it's about the history of Russia which is taught in the uh, Transnistrian school. Actually, it's a uh, Russian textbooks just translated in so-called Moldovan because still today they have Cyrillic, uh, Cyrillic uh, letters uh, using these Cyrillic letters like it was during the Soviet run and just tra translated the, the textbooks for the Russian history and teaching Russian history in uh, uh, Transnistrian schools. So it's another example, official propaganda, Russian propaganda through the education local system uh, in Transnistria. So you could see another textbooks. It's the same, just they change uh, the cover, the color of cover. Um, so um, not just in Transnistria, uh, the Russian propaganda has effects, but also in territory of, of rest part of the territory of Moldova. So uh, you could see when we are discussing about, about the homeland, uh, part of society is considering that Moldova is a homeland, but another part of society is considering the Bessarabia is Romania and should be reunified of Romania. And then another part of society considering that uh, uh, our homeland is Soviet Union and we have to uh, re-establish Soviet Union. And also we have in this context, this, the same group of people uh, are considering that Moldova is a Russian land. Like you could observe in Donetsk and Lugansk or in Crimea, the Russian discourse or pro-Russian discourse that Crimea is Russian land or Donetsk is Russian land. So the same scenario, the same propaganda used in different parts um, of the Russian influence area. So as a result of this propaganda effects and, and also the nostalgia, uh, we could observe some results of some surveys during the last years. So you could see half of population of Moldova regrets the dissolution or the collapse of Soviet Union. And they consider so about 35% uh, consider the Soviet Union system, administrative, political, probably economic system was uh, the best and still today they consider it's the best system and we have to come back. And if they will have the occasion to reestablish or if Moldova to be part of Soviet Union, over 40% uh, of respondents said, yes, we will do for this. So um, you could see that this is a huge um, uh, problem for Moldova. So because we are independent, but half of population thinking um, to, uh, to go back to the Soviet Union, so uh, back in USSR, like the, like the song is. Um, so, uh, and not just the old population. I observed that the many young people are saying the same. Why? Probably because they are coming from these families and discussing, or this is all um, a part of the pro uh, propaganda, the Russian propaganda, which is speculating uh, on the Soviet history, on the Soviet past and the Soviet Union, and let's say victorious uh, 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 past. So uh, one of my colleagues from Romania said quite well, um, so if the, uh, we will look back to the, our recent history, Soviet Union collapsed in December 1991, but uh, it's not so easy uh, to, 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 uh, to accept this idea. So we could move Republic of Moldova from the Soviet Union uh, already for, for over three decades, but how we could move 
Soviet Union from Republic of Moldova and especially from the mentality and from these not nostalgic people. So uh, uh, Transnistria uh, celebrating every year its independence or doing different parades uh, like in the Russian or the Soviet style, trying to demonstrate the force, trying to demonstrate the military stra uh, staff. So you could compare parades uh, in uh, Moscow and also in Tiraspol, and you will find many similarities how they are doing uh, and trying to demonstrate uh, the power and uh, the intention to become independent. So you could see always the local flag of separatist republic and close the Russian flag. No Moldovan flags, no Moldovan symbols, but Russian and Transnistrian always are together. And you could see people have the same flags in hands too. So an example, because we are part of ICOMMONS, and of course we have to discuss about the, the monuments and sites too. I will give an example about the um, very, I think, uh, important and interesting site, uh, Tigina Fortress or Bender Fortress. Even if it's placed on the right side of the bank of Dniester, uh, Dniester uh, Transnistria uh, controlled the, the, uh, this uh, city and the, the fortress too, as a result of this agreement from June 1991. But um, uh, the Tigina fortress has a long history, and we know that it was built uh, during the medieval time and after occupation of Ottoman Empire of this region and Bede uh, Tigina fortress, uh, Turkish administration established the new fortress. So since 1538, actually it's new uh, period of time for uh, Tigina and they recall uh, the, the name of, uh, of the fortress. Uh, and since 1538, it's, it's known as Bender. So Bender is a Turkish name. After that, the uh, Russian administration in 19th century and the Soviet administration use the Turkish language, uh, the Turkish uh, name. Uh, been there, but historically, uh, during the medieval time of Moldovan principality, this area was known as Tigina. So, uh, during the, the uh, 16, 17, 18, until 19th century, until beginning of 19th century, this was a huge, uh, important economic and military uh, fortress uh, controlled by the uh, Ottoman Empire. But as a result of occupation uh, in uh, of the Russian occupation in 1812. Uh, this fortress became part of the uh, Bessarabia and the Russian Empire, and they used, of course, for the military staff, but not so much important like it was before, because it was already part of an integral part of, of, the, uh, of the Russian Empire. But during the Soviet time, the uh, Soviet administration used the fortress for the uh, military base, for the Soviet army military base. And later on, the, the separatist administration also used the fortress and surrounding for the military staff. And just a few years ago, in 2007, they decided to uh, move the military staff from the fortress and to open the museum. So actually, nowadays, it's an open air museum controlled by the separatism administration and everyone who wants to, to go, they could. And they try to reorganize, rebuild, and to uh, rehabilitate the fortification uh, as a museum. But how they did, you will see just immediately. So uh, uh, they uh, built the square, which is call, called Alexander Nevsky Square, because the church is Alexander Nevsky, and it was done during the 19th century. But you know, uh, I have I wrote a paper uh, one year ago about this situation. If somebody is interested, you could find on the internet uh, the English uh, paper, the uh, inventing uh, the Bender Fortress, in reinventing a museum. So you could find more details about uh, about this situation of Bender and this Alexander Nevsky. So nothing uh, links with the Moldovan history uh, or the region, uh, but they trying to like the discourse in Russia that the Nev Nevsky, it's, it's an important guy for the Russian history. Actually, it's a trans transporting the, the, the uh, hero heroism of the Nevsky to Transnistria too. So you could see uh, how, how they build the square uh, in, in this uh, part of the fortress uh, without any uh, the discussions, debates, or plans for conservation or restoration or respecting authenticity and integrity of the of the monument. So they also uh, uh, covered the, the towers and the quality, it's, it's very poor. You could see the size and you could see, if you'll go inside, you'll see that it, it's very 
uh, instable uh, construction and also uh, I think it's it's a dangerous for the future. Also, they built a gallery of this uh, Russian Empire officers, which is not so, I think, according to the, the uh, local history. They played some role during the Turkish, uh, Russian-Turkish wars. Uh, and you could see Baron Mühausen, uh, who was involved in, in this uh, war and uh, trying to build uh, a story, and he is important for the region too. Uh, but another intervention, uh, in, for example, inside of the citadel in the main tower, you could see this uh, cement, beton, and uh, the windows, uh, plastic windows, and also uh, reconstruction of the ditch around the fortress by using the new materials and actually destroying the authenticity uh, of the monument. So you could see how practically building the new fortress. And we try to stress attention to the Moldovan um, official administration of the Ministry of Culture, but nothing happened because the separatist administration do not pay any attention to the Chisinau government or the Ministry of Culture. So they are doing what they want. So uh, just a few weeks ago, we published a report about uh, um, an opportunity to, to uh, try to build the bridges through the culture, to the heritage, uh, common projects uh, and uh, between uh, these two uh, regions and to try to enforce cooperation between Tiraspol and Kishinev and it's called increasing trust through the culture on both banks of Nest River uh, communities. And in this uh, report, you'll see a lot of details about the parallel administrative systems existing. Uh, so actually in Transnistria, uh, most of the, the rules laws are based on the Soviet Union, some of them updated, but according to the Russian system, not Moldovan system. And um, so Moldovan system, it's parallel uh, to Transnistrian one and the, does not enlarge or involve Transnistrian uh, region too, because as I mentioned, it's a real border, even if it's not recognized region, uh, it is uh, actually uh, a territory uh, which is doing or existing for themselves. Um, uh, Doug have distributed a few uh, days ago a short movie about Transnistria and there it's very well pointed about the role of Sharif company, which is very appropriate to the political leaders and which control actually the whole economy of the region. Um, of course, economy is based on different uh, uh, Russian uh, projects and Russian involvement and support, but also uh, different kind of traffic, illegal traffic. Uh, now it's a little bit uh, stopped because uh, most of the, uh, the traffic was through Ukraine and uh, Odessa port, uh, but now um, probably they are uh, in a huge crisis. We will see uh, how it's going on, but of course um, uh, this the economy of Transnistria suffered much as a result of the Ukraine war. So another example, and probably I will stop. So according to the another survey about the role or who are the most influenced important people uh, in, in Moldova. Uh, so you see on the first place, Stefan the Great, which is a ruler from uh, 15th century, but on the second place, it's Vladimir Putin. So not in Transnistria, in Moldova. So, and the third place, it's Stalin. So I think my explanation to this result, it's result of propaganda, of the Russian propaganda through the Russian TV programs, radio broadcasts, and other mass media. And for example, after 2014, it was done another survey about the occupation of Crimea and half of respondents said, okay, it's no problem uh, that Crimea was occupied by, by the Russia. But the next question, uh, it was about Transnistria. If the Russia occupied Transnistria, what do you think about? So you could see about 70% of people, no, 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 we don't want to be occupied by the Russia. And I think this question is very actual nowadays in the new circumstances. So concerning the, the Russian aggression to Ukraine, uh, it's a lot, uh, so many discussions about this. I will not uh, go deeply in this situation, but Moldova, because it's the nearest country, um, it, it is directly involved. And we opened the borders for the refugees over uh, five or let's say half million of, uh, or maybe more Ukrainians cross Moldova. Uh, and uh, nowadays, I think uh, according to official data, uh, over 100,000 Ukrainians settled to Moldova and they living in Moldova with support. But it was very impressed that Moldovans not just opened the gates uh, uh, on the borders, but also they opened the doors of the house 
and supported a lot uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees, uh, giving and uh, advise them or giving them all necessary stuff um, for short or for longer stay uh, on territory of Moldova. So I think it's uh, um, and the same attitude was in Transnistria um, established. So some of journalists did the interview about the situation and local people when have been asked, what do you think about? Yes, we are supporting Ukrainians because they are our friends. And the next question about the invasion of Russia. No, Russia is right. So you could see somehow it's not understandable how uh, the same person helping Ukrainians, but agreeing that the Russia, uh, uh, Russian invasion, it, it's, it's okay for them. So um, about the symbols, about support, and also uh, about the, the, uh, the attitude of people. For example, we have all building of the National Hotel in, uh, to, in, in Tourist Hotel in Kishinev, which is empty, uh, but uh, uh, as a result of Russian invasion in February, uh, a few days later, so you could see it was the Balkans uh, have been uh, painted in the Ukraine flag. But a few weeks later on, um, uh, Moldovan parliament voted uh, um, uh, against Russian invasion symbols, Z, V, and this uh, um, uh, symbol. Uh, and pro-Russian uh, supporters, you see the same building they painted in this uh, uh, Russian uh, symbol, Russian invasion symbol. And then, of course, administration or the Moldovan authorities tried to cover uh, so you could see how Moldovan society react to this situation. And uh, in this context, of course, we are too much divided because um, some of people or most of people are trying to support this Russian discourse that the victory day is very important till today and we succeed in the Second World War. So speculations uh, around the victory in the Second World War by the Russian administration and the Russian propaganda has effects on Moldovan territory too. So you could see also on the road in Gagauzia, this inscription, even if it's a mistake, Russia, we support you, Russia, we swami. And also uh, on another road, Gagauzia, swami. You see, uh, using these uh, symbols of the Russian invasion. Um, so Transnistria and uh, Gagauzia uh, are supporting Russian invasion in Ukraine. And um, uh, you probably have heard about this, uh, some, some recent, uh, uh, situation in Transnistria, somebody attack uh, the building, uh, the granites, uh, the building of uh, security office in, in Tiraspol, and also the, uh, a day or a few days later, uh, also another attack was happening on these uh, antennas. Um, a lot of speculations around this uh, situation, uh, but some experts are considering that it's just provocation from inside of Transnistria to demonstrate that Ukraine or Moldova are trying to involve Transnistria in the conflict. So after that situation, I think it's under control it's, uh, and the people calm and not so uh, much discussing. But you also remember in March, uh, at the beginning of March, as uh, I think immediately, uh, third week uh, uh, of the invasion of Russia and Ukraine, Lukashenko explaining why he is uh, participating or why Belarus is involved and in settling the Russian troops on territory, he showed them up. Uh, and you could observe on the map the military plans for Transnistria region from Odessa and for Crimea and Odessa to attack Transnistria or to involve Transnistria. After that, milita uh, our Minister of uh, uh, External Affairs invited the uh, Belarusian ambassador for explanation, and the explanation was very, uh, I think, interesting. Uh, uh, people didn't understand, and it was a wrong map used by, by, by the Lukashenko. So you could see. Uh, the plans at the beginning of the Russian invasion and it involves Transnistria too. That's why, and still today, so the situation in Moldova or situation in the region, it's quite difficult. So, Quo Vadis and what's going on, I think it's uh, very difficult to say uh, how uh, the near future will uh, be developed, but we hope in the peaceful uh, solution of the conflict, we hope that uh, Russia and Ukraine will stop uh, the, the, the fight and try to find solution for the future peaceful development, which is very difficult, but we hope, we hope that, uh, that the war will stop because it's, it's totally against uh, human being and it's totally against the, the, the 21st uh, century idea of uh, open mind and uh, democratic societies. So I'll stop here and I'm ready for the questions.
even if it's such difficult situation, Moldova, it's still hospital country and welcome to Moldova. And of course, uh, we are uh, open for, for future cooperation of, of all of you. Thank you, Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> There's a lot of content there, a lot of thought provoking content. <clears throat> One of the things I find most interesting is that <clears throat> this is the front line, these Moldova, Ukraine, front lines of Russian expansionism. And I think to the average citizen of the United States, they not top of mind. Russians are playing a long game in that area. And it's my understanding that part of the reason that there might be public support for USSR, it is nostalgia. It's also the fact that the Russians have cut off the flow of energy to Moldova, which has just destroyed Moldovan industry, just, just taking it away because they, unlike providing energy to Transnistria, Transnistria is doing well economically, Moldova is really not doing well at all, for in large part because of the cutoff of the flow of energy, but also because Russia no longer purchases the agricultural goods that were once very, very popular in Russia. Moldovan wine was a prestige type of wine, uh, Moldovan fruit, and there were, there were Russian uh, resorts in Moldova. So that flow of, 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 that part of the economy is just destroyed. So I would be suspicious <laughs> that that's part of the nostalgia. If you're living in a country who's, economy has been destroyed. And you think back to the days when there were, there were th that economy was, was in much better condition. And you look at the, the con contrast with the Transnistrian economy. I mean, it seems like this could be a big factor. Um, one of the questions, and, and I, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm inviting uh, new questions here, but one of the strategies that the Western, well, Europe and the United States are trying right now are, are sanctions. Uh, we're, so we're playing the economic card and we're playing, we're using it as a stick. But my question is, why haven't, why hasn't Europe, why hasn't the United States been there to assist the economies of Moldova and Ukraine? Um, why haven't they done things to build those economies, to salvage those economies from the attacks that they've suffered for, that you've described very well, for, for many de decades? Mm. So I'm, I'm going to look here in the chat um, for questions. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, I guess, a pretty obvious question, but... It sounds as though there's optimism that we will not see, you know, violent confrontations in Moldova. Is that, would you say that that's the overriding attitude of uh, the people of Moldova? Are they concerned? Or, and how concerned are they? Yeah, each conflict has, of course, uh, a direct impact on the mentality of people. And we hope that this crisis uh, will help help many people to understand the real situation and also the impact of the Russian propaganda in the region. Uh, of course, you're right that we are fully dependent on the Russian energy, gas and ele electricity, more or less, because some electricity is coming from Ukraine, um, uh, but some uh, electricity comes from Transnistria which is done uh, as a result of the, the uh, of pumping the gas, Russian gas. So somehow we are uh, dependent on the, uh, fully dependent on the Russian energy and why we didn't build alternative uh, sources or uh, we didn't check for the alternative uh, sources. Um, uh, probably because of the previous governments and the leaders of Moldova, uh, most of them have been uh, under influence of the Russian uh, authorities. And just nowadays, um, the parliament uh, recently voted uh, for the new law to build the, uh, the new network uh, to connect 
Moldova to the European um, uh, energy energetic system. So and that the works already starts. So and we hope that we will be interconnected to this the new network of the European standards already have been approved. And now we just uh, are in the process to build the, the connection network, the real connection, and also the gas uh, pipeline uh, from uh, uh, Romania to Moldova. So probably a uh, huge Russian influence and fully control uh, of the, the Moldovan, uh, let's say, economy probably uh, during the last three decades. It, it is a result that we are still today depending on Russian um, energy. And also, uh, you mentioned quite well uh, about the export of agriculture stuff to the Russian market, uh, which is not the first uh, so uh, um, uh, time. So we were provoked by the crisis, by the, the different uh, uh, sanctions of the Russian sanctions against Moldova in 2003, uh, when Moldova rejected the, the intention of Russia to uh, sign the, the agreement and to. Um, as a solution of Transnistria and to build the feder federative system in Moldova, and then Putin um, canceled the, the or established the sanctions against Moldovan uh, products, wine, fruits, and so on and so on. But I think also it was very bad for our economy. But slowly we tried to reorganize the, the exports, and nowadays Moldova export uh, export quite well to Romania, to other European Union countries, and also to United States. So I think each crisis has some, at the end, has some positive effects because the people finally open mind and try to look for another market and try to also to improve the standards of the products. So we are exporting wine quite well to Japan, China and other markets around the world. So I think uh, uh, we could survive. So the Russia is not uh, the only one opportunity for Moldova, even if we, if we are a very small country, we have to look around and to try to understand who are really friends of Moldova and who are really open to support Moldova and to try to do um, uh, good business and uh, let's say uh, very balanced business uh, with Moldova, not just uh, according to the dominated rules, like Russia is doing always, or uh, or like a, or like Russia, it's trying to control. If you are doing like we want, we will support you. If no, we will sanct you. Which is, I think, it's not it's not correctly in addressing uh, between so uh, relation, di uh, economic relations and diplomatic relations, or in general in relation between two countries, even if we are small country. You explain that very well. So. There was a lot of content in what you presented, and I'm sure a lot of people will what, would like to rewatch what you, what what you you know your presentation. Also, I know that some people were not able to tune in, but I expect a lot of uh, a lot of views of what you presented. Um, I mean, it's just an extraordinary, extraordinarily valuable presentation. It's a it's a primer on the situation in Moldova and also in the other sovereign states to some extent that are near Russia. So the rec recordings of this presentation will be available on the US Ecomos website uh, in a few days, I think by early next week. I wanna encourage everybody who's had the opportunity to listen to this, if they'd like to review it, to go, go come back to our website. Also spread the word that it's available on our YouTube channel for those people who are not able to tune in today. Um, so please do visit our website. You'll see the link. And while you're there, I'll just make the standard pitch. We depend upon members to conduct our work, to continue our work. And so if you visit our website, there's an opportunity to also become a member of U.S. Ecomos, and also to participate in a number of programs and activities we'd like to step up in the future months. Um, and among those are, this, this would be the first in a series of webinars that discusses heritage at risk. And in the future, we will revisit some of the other places that are, where heritage is greatly at risk because of the Russian aggression. So, we're planning to organize webinars on that topic. Um, and also 
we will continue with our program of webinars on World Heritage Sites and the issues associated with them in the United States and the rest of the world. The next one of those standard webinars will be uh, on the White Sands uh, site that's on our tentative list to be nominated to the World Heritage List. And that will be held on July 21, 2020. So Sergio, thank you again so much. Uh, what an enlightening presentation. And I, again, what I think but that deserves reviewing and it's, there's just a lot of content there. Thank you so much and best of luck to you, to your family and to your wonderful uh, citizens of Moldova. Lovely country, lovely people. Thank you so much. Dear Doug, thank you so much. And just briefly at the end, a few seconds, because it was a question and comment. Um, yes, people are afraid. And the, uh, I think the common word for all of us during the last weeks, it's peace. Everyone when you're saying hello, the next word it's peace. If you wish something, not saying just no rock, but wishing the peace. So uh, people understand very, very much what war it is. And I remember from my grandparents uh, who survived the Second World War, they use the same word. I wish you a peace. And I think uh, nowadays it's the same. And a comment from a colleague from Moldova, it was about the, the, uh, the uh, discussion, the format five plus two. I also mentioned during the, the, my few interviews before that this format is not working. And I think we have to uh, discuss for the, another new uh, future format of uh, the debating the future of Transnistria and also the solution, finding the real solution not just improvising, not just trying to follow what Transnistrians wants, but also to do a real uh, discussions and dialogue and to, file, to find the real solution for the future common developments. If we really want to reintegrate the country, if we would like to stay on standby, then five plus two is a format which will not solve the problem of Moldova. So we have to change uh, the position and we have to be a little bit stronger in the uh, discussing the future of Moldova. With that, thank you so much, Sergio. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting. Okay.